Good morning, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from the home of Neurosurgical TV, Miami Beach. Today, we have another Neurosurgical Super Sunday with an all-star cast, and I'll let Vinod introduce uh, the people. Welcome, Vinod. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so it's like, it's yet another interesting session we are having today. So, greetings, everyone. Today, our session is on CP angle and IAM, Indian Lottery Meatus. Our basic idea is to have endoscopic and open approach talks on this area so that we can get a complete 360 degree anatomical orientation of this region. And to give you the uh, talks, we have the stalwarts of the pioneers in this region here. Uh, we have Professor Daniel Marshoni from Verona, Italy, Professor Luis Borba from Brazil, Professor Aib Charyan, and Dr. Insiok Moon from South Korea. And uh, all these speakers require no introduction to you because uh, all of them are well-known across the globe. Professor Daniel Markshon is considered the father of endoscopic lateral skull base surgery. He is probably the biggest name in this region, at least the lateral skull base among the ENT circle. So he'll be talking to you on endoscopic approach and translab approach. And then we'll have Professor Aib Charyan, from, uh, who was previously from Nepal, now he's relocating to India. He will talk to you on retrosigmoid and probably some, he'll silent some translab approach also. And we'll have Professor Insiok Moon from South Korea. He has a huge volume of acoustic neuromas in South Korea. He'll show a glimpse of his experience. And then we have the big name, the Professor Luis Borba from Brazil, who will talk to you on retro sigmoid approach. So with these words, I would like to invite the first speaker, Professor Daniel Marshoni, to deliver his lecture. Professor Marshoni, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, sharing the experience with you regarding uh, internal auditory canal surgery and endoscopic approach, open approach. And if it's possible, I would like to share the, the screen with you in order to start with the lectures. Um, okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, this is great. So uh, the topic uh, is, is quite uh, uh, huge because uh, it's mean uh, speak about the translabyrinthine approach and so open approach and also endoscopic transpromontorial approach that is uh, something new in the, the lateral skull base. Just uh, to start uh, with the experience in the um, translabyrinthine approach, uh, this is our flow chart regarding uh, the brainstem tumor, especially acoustic tumor. And if you are able to see uh, this uh, slide, uh, you can understand that we can distinguish three kinds of tumor. Of course, tumor, really, really large tumor over the three centimeter of tumor. And of course, in, in our clinic, we are performing a microsurgery and we are performing a, a translab approach, transotic approach, but also a retrosigmoid approach in some cases. And uh, or tumor less three centimeter of uh, diameter. And in this case, uh, we are performing also open approaches, translab or uh, retrosigmoid. And finally, intracanicular tumor. And nowadays, we are performing a total endoscopic approach or a, um, transcanal, transpromontorial approach, depending on the case. So, just to speak about the translab approach, um, this is a, a typical example of the translab approach. Uh, are you able to see in a good way the, the movie? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. So uh, the principle of the trans labyrinthine approach, uh, just uh, to uh, show some uh, demonstrative video. Uh, okay, like this, for example. The principle is really uh, simple because it's uh, used the 
the mastoid and of course uh, the temporal bone just in order like a surgical corridor in order to reach uh, the internal auditory canal and the cerebellum pontinengo in order to uh, reduce uh, uh, the morbidity especially the retraction of the cerebellum this is the line of incision and uh, the first step is to perform a wide mastoidectomy and just to elevate the, the flap here and after we can start with the mastoidectomy and you can see here this is the spine of handle the posterior wall of the canal we can start the dissection of the um, of the mastoid one of the most important aspect of the um, translabyrinthine approach is especially to decompress in a good way the middle cranial fossa and the lateral sign so it's really important especially for the beginner to remove all the bone around the sigmoid sinus and all the bone around the middle fossa in order to decompress as much as possible this structure when you are working in the cerebellum pontine angle after this uh, you have to see uh, the labyrinthine block and you have to following uh, the posterior fossa uh, from the labyrinthine block detaching the, the dura from the bone and after you can start after detecting the facial nerve the labyrinthectomy the first step is to remove uh, the lateral uh, canal maintaining the anterior wall of the lateral canal in order to protect the facial nerve and after you can remove all the lateral the superior semicircular canal and the posterior canal until you are able to reach uh, the, the vestibule until to reach the vestibule is really important because uh, you can understand clearly the anatomy between the vestibule and the internal auditory canal the vestibule is one of the most important landmarks in order to reach the internal auditory canal and just to drill around the vestibule you can see uh, the internal auditory canal now they we are using more and more the uh, runger in order to remove the bone and exposing the posterior fossa dura and uh, you have to looking for the jugular valve this is another important step because the jugular valve it's really important to consider it the anatomical conformation of the jugular valve before the surgery especially when you want to decide regarding the approach uh, to the patient because a high jugular valve sometimes is not good for the translab approach and you have to decompress the sinus and uh, is not so easy at the end to reach the cerebral pontine angle and to perform a, a good surgery this is the internal auditory canal you can see that we have to skeletonize the canal from the fundus uh, to the porus and after we have to remove the bone all around the internal auditory canal it's really important to remove this bone in order to have a good access to the cerebellum pontine angle and also to the tumor inside the internal auditory canal after this step we have to uh, open the dura and we have to open the dura of the posterior fossa and after open the dura of the internal auditory canal um, this is the incision of the dura and you can see that we have to remove uh, the, the dura layer and after this is the access to the cerebellum pontine angle where it's possible to see the tumor the indication in our in our department we are using translab approach when the patient has a poor hearing function with a middle and also three centimeter uh, cerebellum pontine angle tumor it's possible to use the translab approach and uh, instead if you have a small tumor just located in the angle or just located in the middle cranial fossa we can use uh, respectively uh, um, of course retrosigmoid or uh, middle cranial fossa this is the dissections of the tumor and you can see that we can looking for the facial nerve at the fundus of the um, internal auditory canal and after we can follow the facial nerve and removing the tumor and uh, at the end uh, you can inspect the cavity you can inspect the cavity with the microscope but also with the endoscope looking for a residual disease in order to uh, to check every angle this is the facial nerve inside the internal auditory canal 
until the entry zone. This approach is, of course, uh, it's really important. Why? Because uh, uh, you can use uh, your instrument over the tumor and uh, without uh, compress the brainstem. You needn't to, of course, uh, retract the, the cerebellum uh, in order to reach uh, the cerebellum pontinangle. And so you can go directly to the tumor and to the cerebellum pontinangle. Uh, the end of the surgery is like this. You have to remove uh, the hincus and after you have to put the muscle uh, in order to close uh, the eustachian tube and uh, the, the antrum. And this is really important to avoid uh, uh, leakage in the post-op and after you have to close uh, with the bony pate in our department. We are using a lot this method and after you can fill the cavity with abdominal fat. Sometimes you can perform a, a really a huge approach of the internal auditory canal, a transapical approach, removing all the bone around the internal auditory canal in order to expose the lesion in the cerebellum pontiangle anteriorly with respect to the, 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 the angle. So you, this is the, the, the section of the transapical approach. Again, another important advantage of the uh, translab approach, uh, we can consider the translab approach also in some cases when you have a tumor like this. This is a young man with a hearing loss with a tumor like this. And in the contralateral side, he had a unstable hearing function because of chronic otitis medium. And in a case like this, one of the most important aspects should be the removal of the tumor and in the same time put a cochlear implants in order to, uh, to try to have a hearing function in the post-op. So when you are able to do this, removing the tumor and also restoring the hearing function, this is the best for the patient. And you can see the translab approach with the, the simultaneous cochlear uh, implant. One of the most important aspects of the cochlear implant and the translab approach, we should consider it the, um, the indication because uh, you can do this only when you have a small tumor. If the tumor is more big, uh, honestly, in, in our practice, it's really difficult to attend a, a good hearing function also with the cochlear implant. Instead, when the tumor is one uh, centimeter or one centimeter enough, you can use also the cochlear implant and you can have also a good uh, results. And again, this is the compression of the nerve and we saw already. One of the most important step is to perform the posterior tip anatomy. You can see this is the facial nerve. The corda is over there. You have to do a posterior tip anatomy in order to reach the cochlea. And this is the round window. Now we are removing the labyrinthine. And again, we can see the internal auditory canal. And this is the porus. The fundus is here. The porus is here. We can open the dura and reaching uh, uh, the tumor. And this is the tumor and the entry zone of the, tu uh, of the facial nerve. And we can cut the dura of the internal auditory canal. And we can start the dissection. Doing the dissection is really important to avoid the trauma on the cochlear nerve. This is the cochlear nerve and this is the facial nerve. And you have to detach in a really soft way the tumor from the nerves in order to uh, have a good uh, cochlear nerve and facial nerve at the end of your surgery. And this is the dissection from the tumor. Again, uh, it's really important to do a um, really soft dissection with the scissor over the uh, nerves. Uh, at the end, uh, you can see this situation. This is the cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea and this is the facial nerve. So 
the nerve uh, are completely preserved and uh, the final check with the endoscope just in order to check uh, it, the residual disease that is um, in a good condition and after we can put uh, the cochlear implant we can put the implant inside the round window this is the round window and uh, of course we have to fill the internal detrital canal and the cerebellum continental and after you can put the cochlear implant. And this is in, uh, the patients immediately after the surgery. You can wake up immediately uh, the, the patient. And after one month, you can open the uh, implants. So it's another important advancement, in my opinion, especially if we are thinking about the NF2 tumor when uh, you have a young patient with uh, a double tumor with the hearing loss. So it's really important again. And of course, uh, the translab approach, but not only translab approach, transtemporal approach are really useful also for tumor really huge, especially for NF2. You can see this uh, uh, NF2 with the compression of the brainstem and in a case like this uh, uh, we used the uh, um, transotic approach that is an anterior extension of the translab approach it means that you have to remove all the ossicular chain and uh, also all the, the um, promontory region and the limits are the internal carotid artery anteriorly the jugular bulb and the facial nerve uh, which is remain in the canal and after this uh, we can remove all the bone in order to reach the posterior fossa. This is possible when you have a tumor with anterior extension in, anterior, in the in CP angle in order to have um, to gain more space and uh, in order to uh, have uh, a more comfortable uh, uh, way to remove the tumor. You can see here the interventory canal was really enlarged because uh, the tumor was uh, really huge and uh, the dissection of the tumor and from uh, uh, the cerebellum pontinangle in this case uh, was an F2 so the, the situation was not so easy because of the adhesion of the tumor and after this uh, we put uh, a ABI in uh, the Lushka foramen and the same also when you have a situation like this you can see here uh, this is a lady young lady uh, with uh, a huge uh, tumor in the infratemporal fossa the geminal schwannoma acoustic neuroma facial schwannoma acoustic schwannoma a, a facial schwannoma with the discompression of the brain stem so the situation was really terrible and also the transtemporal approach uh, it's uh, another important approach with this is was a transcochlear approach with uh, uh, with infratemporal for approach type c in order to remove as much as possible the tumor in this case uh, in order to decompress the brainstem and um, and this was uh, the results after the uh, tumor removal with the decompression of the brainstem Anyway, this was uh, regarding the translab, uh, transtemporal approach. When we are using uh, the endoscopic approach uh, instead uh, to treat uh, the, the acoustic neuroma, just uh, if you are able to see in, in our uh, schematic slide, uh, we are using this just when uh, we have uh, a condition like this, intracanalicular tumor, in a patient with uh, less of 75 years old when we are performing observation and during observation we are able to see a growing of the tumor. In a case like this uh, we uh, are using the surgery and for the surgery we can use the transcanal transpromontoyer approach for sporadic acoustic tumor growing in the cerebellum pontinangle and especially with the limit of the pores so it's really important to consider the transcanal endoscopic approach for a tumor located here with a minimal extension in the cerebellum pontinangle 
or for intralabyrinthine tumor. The intralabyrinthine tumor are tumor located inside the cochlea or inside the vestibule, growing in the internal auditory canal with or without cerebellopuntinangle in vision. Of course, if you have a small tumor growing with a normal hearing function, we are using a middle cranial fossa, and uh, this is a typical example, but we know very well the cranial, middle cranial fossa. But when you have a patient uh, grow with a growing tumor in the internal auditory canal with a poor hearing function, we are using this new approach that is a transcanal, transpromontal approach. It was born from endoscopic expertise in the middle year, and you can use the external auditory canal in order to reach the internal auditory canal. It's meant to have a minimal invasive surgery because you needn't to uh, uncover the door of the posterior fossa, to uncover the door of the middle fossa, to manage the cerebellum, to open the system. You just reach the dura of the internal auditory canal and you are able to uh, remove the bone and to uncover the door of the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porus in a, in a perfect way and in order to remove a tumor like this. You can see this is a young man with a tumor growing during the follow-up entering into the cochlea. You can see here the tumor was entering into the cochlea but was located in the porus. So it means that it's not in the cerebellum pontine angle, just a little bit, but uh, this was a perfect case to remove uh, through the canal. The principle is to use the external auditory canal as a natural corridor in order to reach the lesion, to move our instrument just over the tumor, but not over the middle fossa, posterior fossa, or brainstem. And uh, like, uh, for example, the transnasal approach for uh, anterior scalp base, the same principle. And just to describe the approach, uh, these are some cases. This is the case of the young man. You can see this is the eardrum, the right side the eardrum, the mellus here, the external auditory canal, the skin. The first step is to remove uh, the skin of the sternal auditory canal. You can see the incision is a single differential incision and you have to detach the skin from the bone all around and you have to remove the skin of the ear canal with the eardrum and, and block. You can see now we removed the skin of the external auditory canal with the eardrum and now we are watching inside the tympanic cavity. This is the malleus here the incus is here, the eustachian tube is here, and in order to, um, to gain space with the drill, we have to remove all the bone of the external auditory canal, and the limit are, the anterior limit is the temporal mandibular joint, the inferior limit is the jugular valve, the posterior limit is the third portion of the facial nerve, you can see this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, turn over there, and become a mastoid segment of the facial nerve. And the superior uh, limits, of course, is the tegment of the middle fossa. And you can see here, after this, we enlarge the external canal and we have to remove the incus, detaching the, the incus from the stapes. You can see here, removing the incus is here. And after we have to remove the malleus. So we have to cut the anterior ligamental fold of the malleus, and, and now this is the situation after osseocularic chain removal. This is the anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, and in front of you, you can see the facial nerve. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve is here. This is the geniculate ganglion with the cog and the cochlearyform process with the tendon tendon of the muscle is over there. The stapes, the promontory region where is located the cochlea with the round window and the third portions of the facial nerve turn over there and here you can see this bone is called fustis and this is the finicus bone so now the second step is to remove the stapes in order 
to uncover the vestibule. Removing the stapes, we are entering into the vestibule, and this is the medial wall of the vestibule. And now we know that here you can see this brown spot. This is the spherical recess. The spherical recess is where is located the attachment of the inferior vestibular nerve and is a landmark in order to understand where is located the fundus of the internal auditory canal. In this way, we know where the facial nerve run, especially the, the labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve. The labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve run from the genical ganglia to the spherical recess in this way. So this is the line of the, in the labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve. And the fundus of the internal auditory canal is located here between the vestibule and the cochlea. So we can start to remove the promontory region in order to, to see the cochlea where it's located. And you can see this is a piezoelectric drill that we are using more and more in this kind of surgery. And we remove the promontory region and now we can see the cochlea. This is the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the middle turn and apical turn of the cochlea, and this is the vestibule. Again, the spherical recess is here. If we are removing this bone between the cochlea and the vestibule, that we call it the cochlear vestibular bone, of course, if we are able to remove this bone, we are reaching the fundus of the internal auditory canal, where the internal auditory canal is more superficial. So we can start the removal of this, and you can see this is the fundus of the internal auditory canal, and we can start the dissection of the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porous in order to remove all the bone. In this case, you have to be careful because you can understand where the internal carotid artery run, and always we have to see where the carotid artery is located just to see. And this is again the facial nerve, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. The vestibule was here and we remove all the bone of the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porus and this is the tumor. After this we can start the dissection of the tumor from the internal auditory canal and again when you are lucky, but sometimes it's really difficult to have a, a luck like this, you can move the capsule of the tumor and you can see now the leakage because when you see the leakage, it means that you are reaching the posterior portions of the tumor. And after you have to detach the tumor from the facial nerve. This is the facial nerve. And so you can start the, the, the touch of the tumor. How is possible to uh, move the instrument? If you are able to remove more and more the bone in the external auditory canal, you can use the same technique of the anterior um, skull base. It means that um, uh, mm, one of your staff can hold the endoscope and you can use also two hands in order to remove the tumor. So, is not uh, so difficult. After this, you have to put uh, a fat in order to close the internal auditory canal and also to fill all the cavity. And we have to uh, suture the external auditory canal. Another important aspect of the endoscopic approach is when you want to remove a tumor like this. There are a really small tumor, intralabyrinthine tumor, located in the cochlea or in the vestibule, but um, the indication are for uh, surgery because uh, it's really difficult to control the symptom of the patient. These patients are with a hearing loss uh, with a terrible vertigo, so the indication is for surgery. And uh, these kind of tumor are really easy to remove um, uh, with the endoscopic approach. Again, this is the right side and we have to remove uh, the skin and the drum. We have to drill all around the, the external auditory canal. After this, we can see here the ossicular chain, the facial nerve is here. Uh, we remove the ossicular chain, the facial nerve, the stapes, and the tumor in this case is inside the cochlea. So we have to remove the promontory region, reaching uh, um, the, the tumor, removing 
remove the stapes and again we can remove uh, this is the cochlea and again the same situation the vestibule the facial nerve the basal turn with the tumor the medial turn and apical turn of the cochlea and this is the uh, piezo surgery that we remove until uh, the fundus of the internal auditory canal. This was uh, a cochlear schwannoma involving uh, the fundus of the internal auditory canal. We can start with the removal of the tumor from the cochlea. You can see that was filling all the um, uh, cochlear turn and this is the tumor. And after this, uh, we can start to remove the last piece of the tumor from uh, the fundus. You can see the leakage and uh, after this, it's really important to see uh, the um, anatomical conformations of the nerve. This is the cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea, and this is the inferior and superior vestibular nerve. The facial nerve is always in the middle, but more deep. We can see more in detail, again, cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea, and the vestibular nerve, and this is the facial nerve in the middle and the perspective is quite the different with respect to um, the translab approach but it's really interesting to see the nerves in this kind of perspective and again nowadays we are able also to remove tumor and to put a cochlear implant in the same uh, approach in a simultaneous way so uh, we started to do a transpromotor year approach with the cochlear implant and uh, we are collecting now the data about this kind of patient. Another patient. This approach was born from endoscopic approach, but uh, in order to improve our technique, we convert uh, this approach in a microscopic approach. We call it expanded approach, transpromontorial expanded approach. Why? Because, uh, mm, because the anatomical knowledge we uh, decided to, to start with the endoscope. After this, uh, with the microscope, you can do the same. Look at this case with the tumor located in the, um, in the pyramidal, in the, in the petrus apex along the internal carotid artery and uh, uh, along the internal auditory canal. In this case, we decided to do this approach with the microscopic um, instrument. You can see here, the incision is like a chambot, just an incision like this. And um, the, the approach is the same of the endoscopic approach, but of course you need to enlarge more and more the external auditory canal. And again, you have to remove the ossicular chain. And after, you can start with the same uh, anatomic knowledge. So when you are performing a microscopic approach, uh, it's quite different with respect to the endoscopic approach because you need more space. And so it's really important to remove more and more bone around the external to a canal. And um, also, it's really important to uh, check your anatomical limits in a very good way. And this is the results at the end of the surgical uh, approach uh, transpromontorial with the endoscope in, at the end in order to check if there is some residual disease. Just in order to, um, to show you um, this microscopic approach, I would like to see this, uh, um, this movie. Again, we are in the right side and this is external auditory canal and we are removing the skin and the eardrum and we can see the same step with the microscope with respect to the endoscope. In this case uh, uh, the tumor was located in the internal auditory canal but growing in the straight line with the external auditory canal until the entry zone so in the cerebellum pontinengo but you are able also to get a good surgical window in order to reach the cerebellum pointing angle if you need. You can see this is after um, skin eardrum removal. We have to drill all around the bone, all the bone of the anterior portion of the external vitreal canal until reaching the temporal mandibular joint here. And all the bone here 
in order to gain your surgical window. Again, malleus, incus, and you have to reach the third portions of the facial nerve in order to have a, a good uh, surgical view. And look now the situation, we have to drill more and more the bone and because you have in this way, this is the third portion of the facial nerve, incus malleus, the temporal mandibular joint, the carotid artery one here, this is the promontory region, and um, the view is really nice also with the microscope because it's a straight operation. It's not like uh, um, uh, the middle ear that you need to see uh, around the angle. And uh, the malleus removal, we have to remove the staples and uh, look the situation of the facial nerve. We can see really clearly the facial nerve where it's run and we have to remove the staples. And after you can see this white stop spot this is the spherical recess or oh, let me this is the spherical recess where the the facial nerve run the the sorry where the inferior vestibular nerve run and it's really important in the microscopic technique to remove the cochlear to the cochlear reform process in order to gain space anteriorly and this is the removal of the uh, cochlear reform process and after this, uh, we have to looking for the carotid artery because we need more space with respect, uh, of course, the endoscopic approach. And so you can see uh, then the internal carotid artery is uh, uh, our anterior landmark in order to uh, stop our dissection anterior. And you can see here, this is the carotid and this is the carotid and we know that the carotid one here we know that the jugular barb is here it's really important to check the the, um, the ct scan uh, before because uh, if you have a high jugular barb this approach is contraindicated and after this we can start uh, with the, the removal of the cochlea you can see here this is the basal turn again and after we can start to remove anteriorly in order to, um, to, to uncover the middle and apical turn, middle apical turn. Again, look the situation. There is the vestibule is here, basal turn, middle and apical turn, facial nerve, and this is the cochlear vestibular bone. If I remove this, I can go directly to the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And this is the carotid. So we can remove the cochlear vestibular bone until I can see the more superficial portions of the internal auditory canal. And after this, uh, we can follow the internal auditory canal until the pons. We can check it here. Just uh, look, this is the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the pons. It's really important to remove all the bone around the internal auditory canal. You have already your landmark, the carotid artery anteriorly, posteriorly, the third portions of the facial nerve, superior the facial nerve, tympanic segment, inferiorly the jugular bulb. And if you remove all this bone, you are able to reach the posterior fossa dura. You can see now, this is the blue line of the posterior fossa dura. And after you can start to remove all the bone and after you can open the posterior fossa dura. We, you can cut the posterior fossa dura and the, the view when you cut the posterior fossa dura through this approach is the entry zone. You are in front of the entry zone of the facial nerve. So um, you must know that you can reach the, the, the entry zone of the facial nerve you can see the, the entry zone of the facial nerve is here. And after you can start to dissect the tumor with the two hands. So it's quite diff different with respect to the endoscopic approach because you, you can remove more and more bone and also you can move your instrument in the angle with a more um, safe uh, condition. You can see here the vascular structure and this is the facial nerve in the entry zone and this is the tumor and uh, you can detach uh, and uh, you can reach the tumor and remove. And this is the, the final view after tumor removal. And you can see this is the entry zone, the brainstem. 
the facial nerve run over there and turn in this way. And uh, so just in order to show the possibility of the transcanal approach, of course, uh, but when you have a tumor in the angle, honestly, nowadays I'm using the translab, but this is a new view, a new approach, and uh, that you can use. Honestly, for the internal auditory canal, probably the transcanal approach now is, uh, in my hand, of course, the best. And uh, so uh, we, we have also some uh, our um, paper regarding the use of the endoscope, of course, uh, in the translab approach, in the Petrus Apex, and also the results in 2017 of 49 patients underwent transcanal transpromotor acoustic neuroma surgery regarding the facial nerve outcome. And uh, of course, the outcome is really promising. Uh, so um, I would like to finish my presentation. This was uh, our uh, lateral scalp base surgery. Unfortunately, it was not possible to do because of the coronavirus. But um, I hope that uh, the next year, if everything will be fine, we will be able to do it. So I would like to see you in Verona. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Marsh. It was an excellent lecture. A lot of new things have, has been described over here. Um, there are a couple of questions by the delegates. One of them was, do you drill the bone over the sigmoid sinus in a translab approach, or you retain the bone there? Yeah, uh, in the, in the sigmoid, yes. I always drill the bone over the sigmoid sinus uh, anterior and posterior in order to decompress the sinus because it's really important in my opinion especially when you are working uh, inside the cerebral pontine angle where when you are able you can leave just a small amount of bone over the sinus just to protect the sinus but honestly it's not so the, the big difference is to uh, decompress the, the sinus as much as possible. And the second question was, if the tumor is very much adherent to the brain stem, is it still possible to do a translab approach? Yeah, it's possible, uh, but of course, uh, when uh, the tumor is uh, huge, uh, it's always boring because you have to, to perform the bulking, central debulking, and you have to spend a lot of hour in order to debulk the tumor in the middle. After when you finish your work of the debulking, you can manage all the peripheral aspect of the tumor and is more comfortable. But uh, the secret of the huge tumor is the, the bulk in the central way, the tumor, until uh, it's possible to uh, detach the peripheral aspect of the tumor. And the next question I would like to ask is, you, you described the transpermontal microscopic approach. And I saw you going till the posterior fossa dura and the root entry zone. So what would be the size of tumor, the maximum size of tumor, which can be removed by this new approach? Yeah, it's, uh, this is a, a good um, question. Because uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, at the beginning, we, we thought about uh, how large should be the tumor. Nowadays, one of the most important aspects, if you want to use this uh, working in the cerebellum pontine angle, is to see the, 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 the shape of the tumor, because the tumor should be in the internal auditory canal and can go also inside the cerebellum pontine angle, but in the straight line, uh, regarding the internal auditory canal. It's better don't perform this surgery when the tumor is growing in the cerebellar pontine angle, touching uh, the trigeminal nerve or the lower cranial nerve. And uh, this is a simple uh, method to understand uh, which kind of patient can uh, undergo to this surgery. Thank you, Professor Marshall. It's an excellent lecture. Thank you once again.